Good morning. We welcome you all to our morning service in the OC today, and we do trust that you're keeping safe and well in these difficult times. You're most welcome. It's good to see some more folk with us today as we seek to worship and praise God together. You're very, very welcome. Before we commence our service, uh, can I say that it is with deep regret that we announce the passing of Mrs. Betty McBurney, wife of Sam McBurney, whose funeral was held here at our church yesterday. We want to extend this morning our deepest sympathy to Sam, to Betty's daughters, Alison, Evelyn, Julie, and Jenny. Also to her brother, Robin, and sisters, Patricia and Evelyn, and to all of the grandchildren, indeed, the entire family circle. We come then to your call to worship taken from Psalm 29 and verse 2, where the psalmist writes, Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. And so today, as we worship in person, online, for those who are listening through the internet or through the church dial and telephone service, we ask God to help us see his glory, see his holiness, and we seek to acknowledge his rule. Let us then pray. Let's seek together God's face. Lord Jesus Christ, on this second Sunday after Easter, we want to thank you and we want to praise you that the light of your love shines on even when there is much darkness all around. For your light has come into the world and neither darkness nor evil nor even death itself could overcome it. And we, like Mary, like the disciples, like Doubting Thomas, who have been there with you through Holy Week and the first Easter morning, have been made witnesses to the great resurrection story. Wondering, bewildered, hoping, rejoicing, and sometimes, yes, Lord, even doubting. It's not always easy to believe with our minds and trust with our hearts. So loving Lord Jesus Christ, open the eyes of our faith that we may behold the work of your redemption. Open our minds and our hearts to receive you, Lord, your resurrection glory, your light everlasting. May this time of worship, reflection and celebration be a worthy response to your love and your sacrifice to us. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray. Amen. We're going to come to our first hymn. I'll maybe ask a couple of the stewards to open some of the windows for the airflow that we're meant to have during the hymn, if that's okay. But we'll stand to sing, Be Still for the Presence of the Lord. The Holy One is here. And uh, you can stand if you wish, as we announced last week, if you prefer the change in position, that's okay. Uh, but there may be those who are apprehensive about standing, and if you prefer to sit, will not frown upon you, that's equally acceptable. So either if you wish to stand or sit, uh, that is fine, and we praise God together. Be still for the presence of the Lord, the Holy One is here. Come by before Him now with reverence and fear. In Him no sin is found. We
we come then to our scripture reading this morning, which is taken from Luke's Gospel, chapter 24, and we're going to begin our reading at verse 13. Luke's Gospel, chapter 24 and verse 13, and this is the account of the two disciples on the road to Emmaus. Let us hear God's word. Now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them, named Cleopas, asked him, are you only a visitor, visitor to Jerusalem and do not know the things that have happened there in these days? What things, he asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since all of this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the woman had said, but they did not see him. He said to them, how foolish you are, how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Christ have to suffer these things and then enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus acted as if he were going further. But they urged him strongly, stay with us for it is nearly evening. The day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him and he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? They got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. And there they found the eleven and those with them assembled together and saying, it is true, the Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. Then the two told what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. Amen. And we thank God for this reading from his own precious word of truth. We're going to take this opportunity now to speak to uh, the boys and girls who might be present, and also some who might be at home listening in uh, in due course on our online service. And so uh, I'm going to maybe rely upon one or two of you to help me out, if that's okay. If you think you know the answer, just put your hand up. Is that all right? Uh, that's great. I see you nodding. You're going to help me out. Don't leave me stranded. And if, if that doesn't work, I'm sure some of the adults are not averse to me asking them as well. I'll not pounce on you, but if you put your hand up, that will be fine. I want to ask you a question. Have you ever lost something that was really important to you? Okay, so think about that for a minute or two. Have you ever lost something that was something important and you couldn't find it? Put your hand up if you think you've ever lost something. Good, okay, so we've got two up in the gallery. What about the adults? Anybody, any adults ever lost anything? Okay, fantastic. Some would say I've lost my marbles, but we'll not go into that. So yes, uh, we've all lost things at times. So I wonder, now that you've admitted that you've lost things, I'm going to ask you to volunteer some answers for things that you might have lost, okay? So let's go up to the gallery there. What, what have you lost? Um, a favourite teddy. teddy, right, okay. Uh, anybody else ever lost a favourite teddy? Has that ever happened to anybody else? 
Alan, you've lost a favourite Teddy. Okay, I'll, and have you recovered from the shock of that? No, I, I thought you looked a wee bit shocked. Yes, well, okay, so some people have lost a favourite Teddy. Anything else that you've lost? Oh, yes, okay. A pair of glasses. So you've lost glasses. Were they your glasses? Did you find them again? You did? Okay. Yes, I've done that lots of time, and I can't quite see where Amy is. I suppose I should put my glasses on, actually, and then I will be able to find her. Where, where, wave your hand. Oh, there you are. Yes. Okay. So, yes, Amy will testify that I have lost my glasses before on many occasions, and so I'll say to her, where's my glasses? And sometimes she'll say, they're on your face. You ever done that? You think you've lost them, but they're actually there all along. Maybe I shouldn't admit that. Any other things that people have lost on some occasions, right? Okay, yep. Okay, so maybe a football or a tennis ball or rugby ball, something that you've been using to play a game of sports and you just can't find it. There are all kinds of things that people have maybe lost at times. I wonder are there any adults here who have lost something that they would care to admit to? Or maybe if it's something belonging to their wife. Or James has got his hand up. Yes, James. Oh, dear. So yous and lambs disappeared into a neighbor's field. Uh, so that's not something you want to lose. Sure it's not. Uh, and hopefully they were all located again. Uh, oh, it depends on the neighbor. There you are. You've been warned. So. <laughs> he's not going to name any neighbors. Sure he's not. So the names are now on our screen. Malcolm's going to put them up. But yeah. Uh, sometimes maybe lambs or ewes have been lost. Alan, I don't know if that's ever happened to you. No, you're more organized, are you, with a sheep? Oh. <laughs> You've got good neighbors. There you are. So. Any other things that adults have lost you want to tell me about? Car keys. Car keys, yes. Famous one, car keys. Anything else? As long as you haven't lost your husband and wife and you're out walking. That something can happen, especially when Amy and I are walking, because I get to talk to all kinds of people, and poor Amy's left standing there. So, I'm going to tell you about something I lost, and it happened. I suppose it's be, it would be about a number of years ago now, and we think it happened in the months, although we have taken the months apart and we still can't find it. I'll, I'll let you into a secret. Though I suppose it's not really a secret because Malcolm will have this up on YouTube, and half the world will see it now after I tell you this story. But anyway, basically. Some years ago, I always had a habit after I got married that I would take off my wedding ring and put it on the bedside table before going to sleep at night. Don't ask me why. I don't know any other men do that, to take off their wedding ring before they go to sleep. Winston, it must be all the clever men do that kind of thing, Winston. Yes, well, I, take my, I always took my ring off, set it on the bedside table. Also on the bedside table, there would be a glass of water should I need a drink during the night. But, of course, the wedding ring went missing. And I haven't been able to find it for a long time. And we've searched everywhere in the manse. I am sure I put it in the bedside table. Amy thinks I must have dropped it somewhere else, outside or in the car. The car has been taken apart. We have searched the manse. We have searched outside the manse. And no sign of the wedding ring. I even began to wonder, because the glass of water was half empty and the ring was missing... Well, I began to wonder had I accidentally taken the ring and swallowed it during the night, but let's just say no sign of it. <clears throat> so, that means I am missing a wedding ring. And I'm going to have to replace that, isn't that right, Amy? I'm going to have to get one because it's an awful nuisance, you understand, whenever maybe girls come up and think I'm single. <laughs> and I, I have to explain that I'm actually spoken for and I'm married. And then I wake up and have my cornflakes. But yes... Losing something is not a good idea. Well, here's what I want us to focus upon this morning. When Jesus, our Savior, died on the cross of Calvary, his disciples, his followers, they felt really bad. They felt really annoyed and really upset because they had lost Jesus, so they thought, and they thought they would never have him again. In our Bible reading, we read about two disciples in particular, one is called Cleopas, the other we don't have that other disciple's name. Some people think it might be uh, perhaps a relative. Some people think it might even have been Cleopas' wife. We're not sure. But certainly Cleopas and his companion, they decided to leave Jerusalem where Jesus had been crucified to make their way to the small town of Emmaus. And they were so 
upset and so annoyed, they thought that they had lost Jesus. Eventually, they were sitting along the roadside or walking along and they were discussing all that had happened to Jesus. And Jesus came alongside them because he had been raised from the dead again. But they didn't recognize Jesus. They didn't recognize his risen body. And so they thought he was a stranger. And the stranger asked them, why are they so sad? They tell them of how they've lost Jesus, their friend, how he has died on the cross. Jesus says to them, but don't you realize that the Bible, God's word, tells you that all of this is meant to happen? And he opens up the Bible and he teaches them from God's word. That must have been a really great Bible study, boys and girls. But still, they don't recognize Jesus. So then, of course, the disciples say to Jesus, why don't you come in and stay for the night? Because it's getting very late. Jesus takes up their offer. He goes into their house. They decide to have a meal. And Jesus says grace. He gives thanks to his heavenly father for the food. And when he does that, suddenly they realize, wait a minute. This is Jesus after all. He is risen. He's alive. And he's right here with us. You know, boys and girls, we can't see Jesus with our eyes. And sometimes we think, well, is Jesus really alive? The good news is, yes, he is, because the Bible tells us so. And the Bible is God's dependable and true word of God. And so, boys and girls, spend time reading God's word. Spend time talking to God in prayer. And then Jesus will become very real to you. And in life, when it seems that everything is going wrong or everything is lost, or you're really worried or discouraged like those two disciples, then remember that Jesus is right there with you any time of day or night. And that's the wonderful good news of our risen Lord Jesus Christ, that he's there. He will always be there. He is always present with us by the power of the Holy Spirit. And let's just pray together. Let us pray. Lord, we come to seek your face in prayer and we want to pray for all the boys and girls of our church family and all who are listening in today. We thank you that we pray to the risen Lord Jesus Christ. Yes, Jesus died for us on the cross. We were celebrating that last week at Easter. But today we proclaim that he is the risen Savior. We thank you that you give us hope even when all seems lost. We pray that for all the boys and girls in our church family, and indeed all the boys and girls who might be listening in to this service today, that they would truly invite you into their hearts and lives and then allow you to teach them more about yourself. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to come just now to our prayers for others, and in particular today, we want to remember Her Majesty the Queen, following the passing of His Royal Highness the Duke of Edinburgh. Towards the conclusion of our service, we will uh, stand for the National Anthem. Uh, so we'll just make you aware of that before the end of the service as a mark of respect for the Queen and for the Royal Family. But in our prayers today, we want to bring Her Majesty and all of the Royal Family before the Lord. I'm going to leave a moment or two of silence after I mention them, so that you, in your private prayers, can think of them. So let us then seek together God's face in prayer. Let us just pray. Lord God, we pray this morning for Her Majesty the Queen, following the passing of His Royal Highness the Duke of Edinburgh. Indeed, we remember before you today the whole royal family. We thank you for the Duke of Edinburgh's faithful years of service to our nation and indeed our world as consort to the Queen. We pray for Her Majesty the Queen today that you will be very close to her. Thank you for her Christian faith which sustains her and keeps her and may she draw much comfort from your word today and from the knowledge that many others right across our world are upholding her before the King of Kings in prayer. What we pray for Her Majesty, we pray for all of the royal family. Surround them with your love and care at this very difficult time. We take a few moments.
in the quietness now to bring the royal family and the queen before you. Lord, hear our prayer. We pray for our province in the wake of the recent street violence we have witnessed during the past days. We pray that those in government or in authority, those in the public eye, would choose their words very carefully. We pray for the protection of all who seek to keep law and order and all those in the ground who try to use reason to explain to young people that this is not a good idea. We pray that all of our communities would be kept safe and free from the threat of violence and harm. We pray today for secondary school pupils who will return to school for the first time since lockdown during this incoming week. We pray for them, for their teachers and classroom assistants, asking, Lord, that you would keep all of them safe. We continue to pray for those from our church family in hospital at this present time. Some have received very serious surgery and are recovering. Some are still unwell and continue to need your touch. We pray for them and their families. We understand that it is very difficult not being able to visit in the normal way. So Lord, draw close and minister by your grace. We pray today for the McBurney family following the passing of Betty McBurney. We pray for Sam and all of his family circle, that you will bear them up, that you will surround them with your love and care. And Lord, as we follow our Presbyterian points for prayer, we pray for the country of Portugal today. We pray for Chris and Rachel Humphrey serving as PCI global mission workers in Portugal. We pray that as restrictions there begin to ease, that Chris and Rachel would be able to reconnect with local people and build up their relationships with them. And again, we pray for Ruth McKee from our own church family here. We are glad for the time that she's been able to spend with her family. We thank you that Restrictions have eased a little bit, allowing her to, to walk and meet up outdoors with some others in these times. But Lord God, we pray that you will help her to get the vaccinations that she needs that would enable her to travel back to Arequipa, to Peru in due course. We pray that that will be able to happen towards the end of the summer, possibly, but we know that you're in charge of that plan, that time scale. And we pray again today for the dear folks in Shalom at the school there that you will keep them all safe and all the families connected to the school. Lord, hear all these our prayers which we bring together in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Well, it's hard to believe that a week has gone past since we celebrated Easter Sunday here in our church. And you know, the danger is that once Easter passes by, we can easily begin to forget all about the death and the resurrection of our Lord and Savior. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is, as we said last week, central to our Christian faith. Without the resurrection, then our faith is worthless and to no avail. On the days leading up to Good Friday, which we commonly refer to as Holy Week, and on Good Friday itself, we spend a lot of time reflecting and thinking about Christ's death on that cross. And then when we move towards Easter Sunday, we celebrate as believers, as Christians, as God's people, Christ's resurrection. And it's as if things are brought to a glorious climax. The problem is, after that, it's as if we really pack up the whole Easter message 
and we put it back into the box again, ready to open it up and celebrate once more next year at Easter. But it ought not to be like that. You see, for those of us who are God's children through faith in Jesus Christ, every day ought to be resurrection day. Every day we ought to live by the resurrection and its implications for us. It is the power of Jesus' resurrection that gives us as believers new life. Hope literally comes to life and it is that hope by which as believers we live day by day. We are living in especially difficult, stressful and demanding times due to this global, global pandemic. But having said that, as believers, what great hope we have. What encouragement we have today. Because we live in these difficult days by the power and strength of the resurrected Lord in us. As believers, we tell, we proclaim our resurrected message. We have the greatest news, the most wonderful news possible. And we must proclaim it with passion and we must proclaim it with love and tenderness. You see, the resurrection is the good news that people need to hear in this time. In many ways, we can even argue that because of these difficult days in which we're living, we have been given even more opportunities to share the good news of the gospel. As a church, we're able to make use of social media to proclaim God's word to all who might watch, to all who might listen. We're able to do that over the telephone line. As individual believers, we must be prepared and ready to discuss our Savior and his great work on our behalf as we seek to serve our neighbors, to look out for one another, to check on family members, even on the posts that we place up on social media, we can proclaim God's word. It might be a, a verse that means something special to us. It might be a prayer. It might be something we want to share about how our faith sustains us and keeps us. And that will have a ripple effect and touch lots of hearts and lots of lives. It's good for us to keep our focus firmly on Christ's death and resurrection. And on this first Sunday after Easter... We're going to look very briefly at that post-resurrection appearance of our Lord to the two disciples who were journeying from Jerusalem on the way to Emmaus. It's recorded for us in Luke chapter 24. And you and I know the story very well. As these two disciples journey along the road, they are downcast. They are discouraged. Perhaps we feel like them today because of all that's happening in Belfast, in Londonderry, and in other towns, all the violent protests. Perhaps we feel like that today because of COVID-19 and all the restrictions that it has placed upon our normal way of life. And as these disciples feel discouraged and disheartened, making their way towards a mess, leaving that terrible scene behind them in Jerusalem of Christ's death on the cross, they are confused. They thought that Jesus was the promised Messiah, that he was going to redeem and set the people of Israel free. But they hadn't fully understood, they hadn't fully grasped what Jesus was all about. They hadn't got their heads around what his true purpose, his true mission was really all about. They didn't know, they didn't understand, but we can be sure that Jesus did. There is absolutely no question that all along Jesus knew what his destiny would be. It would be the cross of Calvary. As the Messiah, he knew full well that he was going to be handed over to the chief priests, to the leaders, to be crucified and then raised from the dead on the third day. But the disciples found this hard to process, hard to comprehend. All the way to Jerusalem, Jesus had been trying to explain this to them. He had tried to teach them. He had tried to open up God's word. He tried to reveal these things to them, but it was just not sinking in. They were shocked, confused, utterly devastated by 
the events of Jesus' passion, his arrest, trial, suffering, and that awful death. Jesus, the one who was supposed to be the Messiah, was made to suffer the most humiliating death possible, death on a cross. And they were scandalized by all of this. No wonder then that as they made that journey, they were downcast and despondent. And as if all of this were not enough, strange stories were beginning to do the rounds. Gossip was beginning to circulate. And that gossip was saying that, have you heard, the tomb is empty. Jesus is apparently alive again. And so these two disciples, Cleopas and his companion, some commentators even suggest that the other disciple Cleopas, with Cleopas might have been his wife. They make their way along that dusty road from Jerusalem towards the village of Emmaus. And they're in discussion about all that has happened. Can you believe it? Isn't this awful? What are we going to do? Do you think they'll try and come after us now? And then Jesus simply draws up alongside them. And he asked them the question, what are you talking about? Why do you look so worried? What are you discussing? And they're taken aback. How can it be that this person who has joined them in the road, who has presumably been in Jerusalem with all the other pilgrims, doesn't know about the shocking things that unfolded there in that city? So very patiently, very indulgently, if you like, they begin to explain about Jesus of Nazareth and, and what had happened to him. The one who was a great teacher and a prophet like Moses. They explain how they'd been following after him. They'd pinned all their hopes on him that he might be the Messiah, the promised one to deliver them. But then they say, our hopes have all been dashed. They have all been crushed. Jesus is no more. Then they go on to tell this stranger about these strange stories that are circulating. That how they have got some reports from women among them who went to the tomb to anoint the body for burial. But they found the tomb empty. They said that they saw two men in white robes who were speaking to them of how Jesus was now alive. And as they explain all of that to this stranger on the road, there is that unspoken assumption on the part of these two followers of Jesus that God's true Messiah, true Messiah could never die such an awful and scandalous death. That public humiliation, that awful execution, well, that doesn't add up to Jesus being the promised one, to Jesus being the Son of God, to Jesus having the highest honor before the Father. Because at the heart of their confusion is their failure to understand what Jesus had patiently and lovingly tried to teach them time and time again since they left Galilee. That the Messiah must suffer, die and be resurrected and his disciples are to take up their cross and follow after him. It's at this point in the story that you can almost feel the frustration of Jesus. He can't hold himself back any longer. And so he says, oh, how foolish you are. How slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have declared. And so as they walk along together, Jesus, without yet revealing himself, well, Jesus opens up the scriptures. And he begins to explain to these two disciples about all that was part of God's plan. We read there, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. Now, I've been to many Bible studies, and many Bible studies have truly blessed my soul and my heart. But can you imagine what it must have been like to be there with Jesus, and he is the one that's opening up the Bible and explaining it? Indeed, these two disciples will later say how our hearts burned within us as the stranger opened up the scriptures to us. But now we come to the great turning point in this account. These two disciples, they reach their destination. They've arrived at Emmaus and Jesus begins to 
almost make it out to them that he's going to walk on a bit further. And so Cleopas and his companion, they say to Jesus, look, it's getting very late. Why don't you spend the night with us? We'll give you some refreshment. We'll give you a bed for the night. Then you can go on your journey in the morning. And so Jesus accepts their kind offer of hospitality. And in the home, as they decide to have that meal, Jesus says grace. He takes the bread, he blesses it, he gives thanks to God the Father for it. And then their eyes are opened and they recognize their Savior just as he disappears from them. You know, this isn't the first time that Jesus has demonstrated who he is through the breaking of bread. Think back to to Galilee and to how Jesus fed the 5,000. You'll remember that Jesus told his disciples to to gather all of the hungry people together, the vast crowd of people together, and then to bring to him the meager portions of fish and bread. And then after Jesus blessed the food and broke it, there was suddenly more than enough to feed everyone in the crowd. And then people began to realize Jesus. There was something different about him. Maybe this is the Messiah. Maybe this is the promised one. In fact, Jesus afterwards asked the disciples the all-important question, who do you say that I am? And that's the really important question that we all must think about today. Who do we say Jesus is? Does our faith enable us to perceive Jesus as God's precious and only Son? The Messiah the Redeemer who had to suffer and die so that through his death and resurrection we could have new life in him? Or do we think he's simply just a good moral example, a mere prophet or teacher? We discussed that last week, how academics and scholars have debated that down through the years. On the one hand, there are those who would argue, yes, he was a wise teacher, he was a sage, He had a remarkable ability to mediate God's presence to others. There was something special about him. We can learn a lot from him, no doubt. He offered us great teaching, a moral example of compassion that's worthy of our emulation. But that's the end of the matter. But that is not what Cleopas and the other disciple discovered. You see, through their encounter with the risen Lord Jesus Christ, They came to understand, their eyes were opened up, that there's a world of difference between seeing Jesus as a wise teacher and understanding that he is, in fact, the Son of God, the Messiah, the Redeemer. One commentator writes, a prophet speaks for God. The Messiah is God, God in the flesh, who redeems and transforms our lives by giving his very own. In other words, only the Son of God, only the Messiah could change our lives. Before we come to the end of our sermon this morning, there's something I'd really like you to notice with me, something that we mustn't skip over. Because notice with me what the two disciples do after they realize that they've been in the company of the risen Lord Jesus Christ. Once their eyes are opened, they realize that he is the Messiah We find it there in verse 33. It says, they got up and they returned at once to Jerusalem. Now, whenever we read that well-known account in the Bible, we often skip over that statement. They got up, they go back to Jerusalem. It doesn't really hit us. It doesn't really speak to us in any great way. But when you stop and read that slowly and carefully, they got up and they went back to Jerusalem. It really makes you think. Because remember that in Jerusalem, there was all the persecution. Jesus had been put to death on the cross. The place was an uproar. Now, if we'd been one of those disciples, would we, if our friend had been crucified, our friend whom we had followed, we were part of his inner circle, would we have wanted to go back to Jerusalem? Surely not. We would have wanted to put as much distance as we could between ourselves and the city of Jerusalem. It would not have been safe for them to go back 
But yet, that's what we read here happens. They leave a mess and they head back towards the city. That's how life-changing their encounter with the risen Lord really had been. You see, they're no longer discouraged. They're no longer puzzled. They're no longer afraid. They realize that they need to turn around and head back to Jerusalem. They've got to be with the other followers of Jesus. They've got to be together. How important is fellowship with our brothers and sisters in the Lord? You see, that's what happens when you encounter Jesus. It turns your life around. When you come face to face with Jesus, it transforms your life. It changes your outlook, your priorities. For the one who hears God's call and trusts in Christ Jesus, a total transformation happens. Following the Messiah means that we make him Lord. We put him and our whole life at our disposal. We give him first place, even if that involves risk, even if that involves getting a hard time. So here's the big question as we leave this account today. Are we willing to trust Jesus enough to let him be the Lord of all of every part of our lives, not just a small part, but every part? Are we willing to say to him, along with the hymn writer today, all to Jesus I surrender, I surrender all. Because that's precisely what Cleopas and the rest of the disciples did when they went back to Jerusalem. There they shared their stories of the risen Lord Jesus Christ and they strengthened and encouraged one another's faith. Then they adopted a creed, the very first Christian creed. It was a very simple creed. Just three words, in fact. Jesus is Lord. Because they trusted in Jesus as the Messiah, they let him take full control of their lives. And others noticed the change. And they were attracted to Jesus in turn. And they, the disciples, began to explain to others about their Savior. And what started as a movement of no more than a hundred disciples became, in fact, a following of thousands. And then millions. And then billions as the church began to grow and multiply, as God's word began to spread right throughout the known world. You know, what a difference comes into our hearts and lives when we proclaim Jesus is Lord, when we see him for who he really is, when we profess faith in Christ, not only with our lips, but as we demonstrate it with our lives. What a difference it will make. Let's just pray together. Lord God, we thank you for your word today. We think of those two disciples making their way out of Jerusalem, no doubt quickly, wanting to leave behind the dreadful events that they had witnessed there, the death of their Savior in the most horrible way, the persecution that they knew was imminent upon all who were associated with him. And so they head out of the city. They're discouraged, they're despondent, they're puzzled, they're afraid. They don't know what to do. Jesus opens up the scriptures, draws alongside them, and we acknowledge today that you do that so often for us as your people. In the times of difficulty and hardship, you draw along beside us. And what a difference your presence makes. And then as Jesus goes in and enjoys the meal with them and breaks the bread, they realize it is the Messiah. It is the risen Lord. And what happens? They head back to Jerusalem. Back to be with their fellow believers. Back to proclaim fearlessly and with boldness and courage the good news that Jesus is Lord. And the church begins to grow. Lord God, we pray that we here as your people would be emboldened and strengthened today to proclaim that Jesus is Lord, not just with our lips, but with our lives. In our Saviour's name we pray. Amen. Our concluding hymn is very appropriate. The words, here is love vast as the ocean. As we think about the vastness of Christ's love for us demonstrated at Calvary, Surely our only response can be 
to proclaim Jesus is Lord. Let us praise God together. Next Lord's Day, we hope to have our PW service. We normally do this every other year, uh, but we thought it would be an opportunity for some of the ladies in our congregation uh, to share in our service in these uh, difficult times that we're going through. And so the ladies have agreed to do that next Lord's Day, and that service will also be available online in the usual way through, through YouTube, Facebook, and at the dial-in telephone service. The service will be at the usual time of 11.30 a.m., and then an announcement with Mark Walker and the Sunday School team to remind parents that Sunday School will recommence next Sunday morning at the usual time online. Uh, so uh, they have been doing that very kindly for us during lockdown and during this period of restriction. A little break for uh, the teachers over Easter was in order, but uh, they will recommence again next Sunday morning at the usual time online. Uh, and then also I think elders will have received information by email regarding a very brief meeting that we need to have on Thursday night of this incoming week at 7.30 just to discuss some uh, new information that has come uh, from the executive and will be coming this week and from Church House. I think these then are all of our announcements at this stage. We're going to uh, have the benediction and then once I finish with the benediction I'll ask you please to stand and we'll have uh, the national anthem at that stage as a mark of respect to Her Majesty the Queen and the royal family in this time of loss and bereavement. And so now, may the grace of our risen Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God who is our Heavenly Father, the fellowship and communion of the risen Lord Jesus Christ, who can turn and transform lives around so that people proclaim Jesus is Lord. May your presence abide with us this day and even forevermore. Amen. We stand.